Building a home is supposed to be a joyful milestone in anyone's life. For me, it was supposed to be the beginning of a dream I'd shared with my husband Matt for years. But as the walls of our new house went up, the foundations of our marriage began to crumble. My name is Angela, I'm 30, and we have a three-year-old daughter named Tracy. My husband Matt, who is 35, and I had always wanted to build a home of our own. People around me might have thought I was excited and filled with joy, but behind that facade, everything was falling apart. It all started when we got serious about house hunting. Both Matt and I worked long hours, so our weekends were spent checking out properties and finalizing construction plans. Tracy, being so young, wasn't exactly thrilled about the process, so we usually left her with my parents, who lived close by. But one weekend, things didn't go as smoothly as planned. My dad fell ill and had to be rushed to the hospital. With no one to watch Tracy, I suggested canceling our real estate appointment, but Matt had another idea. Why don't we ask my parents to take care of her, he said. His parents lived a bit farther away, and to be honest, I didn't get along with them very well. They were often critical of me, and I always felt judged. Still, not wanting to delay our plans, I reluctantly agreed to leave Tracy with them, hoping it would be just for the day. After our errands, I picked up some fancy sweets as a thank you gift, and we headed to my in-law's place to collect Tracy. They were unusually warm when we arrived, probably because of the sweets. On the way home, Tracy, who was sitting quietly in the back seat, suddenly asked, Will Grandma and Grandpa have rooms in the new house? Her question threw me off. What do you mean, sweetie? Did Grandma and Grandpa say something about that, I asked. Tracy, in her childlike way, shrugged it off and started playing with her stuffed penguin, but the seed of doubt was planted. Had my in-laws mentioned moving in with us? I brushed it aside, thinking maybe they were just curious about the new house. But as the weeks went by, my in-laws started showing up more often. They would visit unannounced, especially on weekends, and soon, my small, cluttered apartment felt even smaller with their constant presence. One evening, they insisted on seeing the house plans. Before I could protest, Matt eagerly spread them out on the dining table. I stood by, watching as my mother-in-law began nitpicking every detail. The kitchen's too small, she said. And only one extra bedroom? What if you have more children? Where will they stay? Her barrage of questions felt like an interrogation. She had an opinion on everything, from the layout to the choice of furniture, and before I knew it, I found myself on the defensive. Well, we've already finalized the plans, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. The foundation is being laid, so we can't change anything now. But my mother-in-law wasn't finished. She considered herself an expert on homes because, as she proudly told me, she had been to many houses and knew what worked. I could feel my frustration bubbling up. It wasn't just about the house, it was about control. Every time she came over, it was like she wanted to have a say in how we lived our lives. That night, after they left, Matt and I had a heated argument. Why do you have to be so cold to my parents? He snapped. They're just trying to help. Help? I replied, my voice rising. They're meddling in our decisions, constantly criticizing everything I do. It feels like they're taking over our lives. You're overreacting. They just care about us, Matt shot back, turning his back to me. The more I tried to explain how I felt, the more distant Matt became. It was as if I was talking to a wall, and I realized then that his loyalty would always be with them, not me. As the months passed, the tension only grew worse. The house construction was almost complete, and it should have been a happy time for our little family. But then, one evening, Matt dropped a bombshell. By the way, he said casually, my parents are moving in with us. I stared at him, trying to process what he had just said. What? When was this decided? We never discussed living with them. They need a place to stay, and we have extra rooms, he said, brushing it off as if it were no big deal. It makes sense. I was livid. How could he make such a major decision without consulting me? Matt, this is our home, not theirs. You can't just invite them to live with us. Besides, we haven't even moved in yet. But Matt was firm. His parents had already seen the house, without my knowledge, and they had even chosen their rooms. I felt betrayed. This was supposed to be a fresh start for us, but now it felt like I was being trapped in a situation I never agreed to. The day we moved into the new house, my in-laws arrived with a moving truck filled with their belongings. 
They acted as if it was their house, criticizing everything I did and making themselves at home. I tried to stay calm for Tracy's sake, but inside, I was seething. Later that evening, I finally confronted Matt. I can't live like this, I said. Your parents are overstepping every boundary and you're letting them. They're my parents, Angela, he said coldly. You need to respect them. Respect? They've done nothing but make my life miserable. I won't stay here if this is how it's going to be, I replied, my voice shaking with anger. And then Matt said the words that changed everything. Maybe we should get a divorce. For a moment, I was stunned. Divorce? It had been lurking in the back of my mind, but hearing it aloud was like a slap in the face. Still, part of me felt relieved. Fine, I said, trying to remain calm. Let's get a divorce. Matt's eyes widened. He hadn't expected me to agree so easily. Wait, Angela, I didn't mean it like that, he stammered. But I was done. The love I once felt for him had been slowly eroded by the constant interference from his parents and his refusal to stand by my side. You've already made your choice, I said, and now I'm making mine. The next day, I packed up my things, gathered Tracy's belongings, and left. I drove to my parents' house, where I knew we would be safe. As soon as I walked through the door, my mom hugged me tightly. She didn't need to ask what had happened. She could see the pain written all over my face. Over the following weeks, I filed for divorce and hired a lawyer. I had kept meticulous records of everything, the money I had contributed to the house, the loans I had taken out in my name. I wanted to make sure that Matt couldn't take the house away from me. One afternoon, Matt showed up at my office. We hadn't spoken since I left, and I wasn't sure what to expect. He looked tired, worn out, and as we sat down at a nearby cafe, I could tell that he wasn't the same person I had married. Angela, he began, I've been thinking. I'll give you the house. I just, I can't afford to pay you back right now. Can we forget about the money? I stared at him, sipping my coffee as I processed his words. You should have thought about that before, I replied. I suggested we share ownership of the house, but you insisted on putting it in your name. You borrowed the money, and now you have to pay it back. Matt sighed. I never wanted the divorce. I just said it out of frustration. But it was too late for apologies. I'm serious, Matt. This is over. You made your choice. As I stood to leave, he reached out. Please, Angela. I'll take care of Tracy. His words sent a shiver down my spine. I had no intention of letting him or his parents take my daughter away. When I returned to my parents' house, I immediately told them to be on guard. Matt and his parents were becoming desperate, and I wouldn't put it past them to try something underhanded. A few days later, the daycare called me, saying that Matt's parents had shown up, demanding to take Tracy home with them. I rushed over, furious. When I arrived, my in-laws were waiting for me in a separate room, their faces twisted in anger. You thief, my mother-in-law spat. Give us our granddaughter. I stood my ground. I'm not a thief, and Tracy isn't yours to take. This is my daughter, and she stays with me. After that encounter, things escalated. Matt and his parents continued to show up, hurling insults and trying to force their way into my life. But I recorded every interaction, every threat, and I knew I had enough evidence to protect myself and Tracy in court. The divorce dragged on, but eventually, I won. The house was mine, and more importantly, so was Tracy. Matt's financial troubles only deepened, especially after he was forced to sell the house at a loss. With mounting debt and nowhere to turn, he and his parents moved back into their old house. Rumor had it that his divorced sister had also returned home along with her two teenage sons. The once proud family was now crammed into a small, rundown home, living in chaos. As for me, I rebuilt my life. Tracy and I moved into a small, cozy apartment near my parents, and slowly, I began to heal. Four years later, Tracy was a happy second grader, and I had found love again with a man who treated me and my daughter with kindness and respect. He too had a daughter, and the four of us began to build a life together. One day, as we were all sitting together, Tracy looked up at me and said, 
What if we built a new house? One where we all have our own rooms, and maybe even a dog? I smiled at her. The thought of building another house didn't scare me anymore. This time, I knew it would be different. Yes, I said, hugging her tightly. Let's think about making everyone happy together.